When I begin today's presentation, I want to ask you all one question, and that is to think about who your favorite person in the world is. This could be a brother or sister, mom or dad, or one of your best friends. Now that you have this person in mind, I want you to think about why he or she is your favorite person in the world. This could be because maybe they're very funny, very smart, or maybe they're very loyal people to you. Now I guarantee you that we've all chosen a lot of different people in this room. But I can also say with a lot of confidence that all these people, although different, share one same trait. And that is, is that they're all very integrity-driven people. Similarly, the company of Atlantic Lottery prides itself on being on using integrity when conducting its business. And this comes in the form of conducting business that is fair, trustworthy, and honest. We plan to further this through helping you to launch your program with respect to the customer loyalty program by using big data. Now big data is loosely defined as a large collection of raw facts that describe certain transactions or events. And big data has three main characteristics to it. It's volume, variety, and velocity. Volume comes in the form is that there's a lot of information that is out there today that businesses are able to use in order to enhance its operations. In terms of variety, it comes in many different formats, whether it be in a Word document, PDF, video, or whatever the case may be. And the last one, meaning velocity, means that information is collected at a very rapid pace and businesses need to use this effectively to make the most of the information that they have. Hello everyone, my name is Eric, and these are my partners Paul and Sharanya. And we are part of the project management team here at Atlantic Lottery. And today we will be discussing how we plan to help you successfully launch your customer loyalty program through our strategy here today. Now we will be covering this through four main parts. Our recommendation, followed by an analysis, then next steps, and briefly going over some financial information related to it as well. So to start things off, I'll be giving it to Paul to talk about our mandate here today. Thanks, Eric. So right off the bat, the, the mandate that we wanted, uh, that uh, Shrania and Eric and myself would like to present to you is to build a player loyalty program for the video lottery terminals to gain valuable information about the players, but also increase that engagement that you have been looking for. So to begin, we'll dive right into the... the doesn't work. Uh, we'll dive right into uh, the recommendation. So with your recommendation, uh, we have the three main strategies that we'll be talking about that Eric will be going further in the next steps along with Shrania into the timeline. But with the first aspect is the social responsibility of the loyalty program. So as you have mentioned, the Atlantic uh, Lari does pride itself in putting back the profits that you make back into the community, whether it's for schools, buildings, or for the people of uh, the Atlantic area. And because of that, we feel that this is a very uh, strong uh, requirement that, you should that we should consider in order to move forward. The second is revamping that player account management system. So although that PAM system is present, we do want to add more fields in order to uh, really segregate um, what, what it means to be a player, uh, how long they're taking, how long they're playing, and you know the gender and the income so that we really know and dive into the nitty gritty to uh, advance this loyalty program. 
And the third is creating the benefit for Atlantic uh, Lottery. So as much as we do want to put profits back into community, we also do want to access as a crown corporation on how to make that profit and put it back into community, but also to use it uh, for the government so that you can uh, further advance any other projects and initiatives. So with that, another aspect that was present uh, present is the, uh, the card versus the login aspect. So with this, this is the idea of using either a card, a uh, physical card loyalty program, or using just a, uh, a login information. So with the card, it is a physical material, and by human nature, a lot of people are materialistic. So the fact that they do have a physical card with them in their pocket, and the fact that they have to use it when they're going into these uh, terminals, makes them feel uh, you know, very, uh, very loyal, sort of really wanting to use that machine because they do feel a part of an exclusive club. The second is that it is easier to use compared to the login because you won't have to memorize any login uh, information or passwords. And the third is it would also engage both the casuals and also the regular players. So as, uh, with regular players, they would in a way benefit with the login because they'll constantly be checking those online information. But with casual players, for someone who let's say plays only once a week, they'll likely be using those physical cards that you can just swipe on the terminal and use right away. And like I mentioned with the login, no need to worry about forgetting the card to play because you'll always have that in the commitment to the memory. But also second, it is a bit more intuitive to use with the online website like I mentioned. So going on to next uh, is an analysis that will give us a quick snapshot of what the current situation is. So with Atlantic Lottery, it is a crown corporation to regulate lottery games in the Atlantic Canada region. Uh, the second point is that it also aims to better communities like I mentioned uh, from the generated profits to put back into schools and other buildings. And, and thirdly, it does have five different types of games to individuals that you can play. But with that, the video lottery is the most prominent uh, version, as it is the biggest source of revenue, uh, as I mentioned, 65% uh, of ALC's overall profits. It also has 7,000 terminals in that Atlantic region, but also three different terminal types and prominent uh, social responsibility presence is needed. And with the loyalty program, uh, this all sums up in the sense that uh, through the uh, video lottery, which is 75% of the overall uh, the profits, we do want to be increasing the player engagement so that Atlantic Lottery can uh, put, make sure that all that profit is getting put back into the community and also tracking play information, like I mentioned, to add additional fields to those, uh, the, the, the PAM system but also getting the third party to build the API and the GUI to be used with that PAM system. Now given the information that we've seen so far, it can be clear that just like big data, there's a large volume of things that need to be taken care of in order to ensure that this project is implemented successfully. So some people might be a little dizzy when they're faced with situations like this, but we want to take that and spin it for success with our strategy that we have for you today. So with that in mind, I'll be passing it along to one of my colleagues to talk about the assumptions that we presented for the case today before we delve deeper into the information. Thanks, Eric. So we have two assumptions that we have presented in the case that we feel is very safe to assume. So the first is the two operations subject matter experts are the go-to individuals regarding those technology of the program. So those subject matter experts within Atlantic Lottery will be working with those th that third party in order to better understand how uh, in the technological aspect on how this lottery would work, but also to uh, when in the closing phase of uh, the project uh, management that you will understand on how to maintain that system, how to uh, make it operate on a day-to-day -day basis, and so on and so forth. And with that second uh, aspect is that the loyalty cards will solely act as a profile and reward card and players can actually not load money into it. So initially you might think that putting money into that, uh, being able to put it into the card might be a better aspect because you know they'll be more willing to uh, spend it. But the idea of the card is that they do sort of put a limit on how much they spend to really regulate the whole idea of you know safe gambling. But also the, uh, the fact that in a security issue, the more streams that you have in terms of being able to put uh, money into on how to play. You do have security risk in terms of thinking about you know, how do you mitigate any security threats that might apply if someone were to take this card and use it for their own benefit. So with this in mind, we wanted to present to you what our overarching strategy is here today. So there are three main components that we want to address within our strategy itself. So the first one being the social responsibility of the loyalty program, as again, this is something that Atlantic values itself on quite highly. 
In addition to it, we want to talk about re revamping the player account management system that is currently been proposed in order to make better use of the information that you will be collecting from prospective clients and customers. And then the third one that we want to talk about was how we can actually create benefits for the Atlantic Lottery Corporation itself. So Paul briefly touched upon this earlier, but we'll be going into more detail about these points in the following slides. So with the first one with the corporate social responsibility enhancement, we want to talk about how that actually relates to the points program itself. So one thing that we wanted to address was how people perceive the video game lottery machines that are currently in stores. So when it comes to product perception, that is often how people will decide whether or not to buy a product. People don't buy cosmetic products or perfumes or fragrances because they're actually chemicals in a bottle. They buy them because they represent beauty or being able to enhance how you look as a person. Similarly, with the lottery machines, we want to change them where people don't see them as a machine that makes you money, but rather as a machine that makes your community money instead. This is really how we plan to do it through the Corporate Social Responsibility Program. So with this in mind, if someone were using the machine itself, rather than simply being awarded the dollar figure that they initially thought they would get, we would also want to touch upon the fact that they would also be benefiting the community in some form or another by stating that X number of dollars will be donated towards a broad category within the government itself, whether it be in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, or Newfoundland and Labrador. In addition to this, we also want to reduce the probability of over-gambling by our customers. So a major problem for people who tend to gamble is that they aren't necessarily in control of it at times, and they aren't aware that they are gambling too much as a result. This can have drastic impacts on how they live their life and can impact not only themselves, but their families as well in the process. So we plan to address this by having several instances where we can remind people that they need to stay within their limit when it comes to gambling. So one way that this could come in the form is, is within their account itself, we could have some sort of spending management system. So similar to how a lot of banks have a Track My Spending app or some form of information like that, customers will be able to tell how much they're gambling and when they're gambling it. This way, they'll be able to be more aware of their patterns and be able to take corrective measures if necessary. In addition to this, we also recommend that the program has some sort of alert that comes on. So if someone starts exceeding their monthly or weekly limits, they'll be provided with a notification telling them that they have exceeded it and that they should be aware of the consequences that could come as a result of this. Now you may be wondering, with the CSR program, what exactly we will do to help address these certain uh, economic situations that can come as a result of over-gambling? And this is addressed in the second portion when it comes to revamping uh, the PAM system here. So with this in mind, what we want to do is actually implement preferences for people. So with the data that we're tracking, within a person's profile, they can indicate whether they prefer their money to go towards roads, hospitals, or educational institutions, or things of that nature. Now if I recall, Sharanya, you're a big fan of books, right? I love Harry Potter. You love Harry Potter. So would it be safe to assume that if you were setting up a profile, it would look something like this? where you'd place a preference on libraries and schools where you can have more access to books. In addition to this, you can consider adding several other components to the profile as well. So within the existing customer records, there's certain information such as their spending limits, their address, and things of that nature. We want to add certain features as well, such as their age or gender, as these can be indicative of what programs they would want to take advantage of in their respective communities. And by having better information, we can better use the funds of the government when it comes to helping to improve the overall quality of living within these areas of Canada. On top of this, we also want to display people's <coughs> usage relative to their income as well. So this is just a test to the fact that with information that we have nowadays, the possibilities are endless with what you want to add to it. So an additional feature that could be added is for people to indicate what range of income they make on an annual basis, and then using the information from other customers who have provided the same information to us, they'll be able to know relative to other people with similar economic standing, whether they're gambling too much or whether they're under the amount that someone in their situation would typically spend when it comes to gambling. Now the third part of the strategy relates to the benefits for Atlantic Corporation itself. Because we realize that we want to help the people as well as the provinces that are using this lottery money, but we also want to make sure that the company itself is able to sustain itself and receive some benefits on its end as well. So one thing that could come as a result of this is you can remove a lot of idle machines that are present in your stores. So as it was stated, there are roughly, there's up to 25 machines at any single location. However, most locations have between five and 10 machines. Now when it comes to paying to have these machines in these specific locations, 
They could be paid for in the form of potentially a percentage of the winnings that are made off the machines or a flat rate that the retail provider would want to set for us. Now, with this in mind, we would be able to identify and remove any idle machines by tracking how frequently these machines are being used and how much money is coming out of them. Now, with this in mind, we'll be able to remove these idle machines, which would reduce costs with respect to renting the space, as well as any maintenance that is required to be used with these machines as they're used on a daily basis. On top of this, this can also be used to help us learn where to allocate the profits that we're making as a company. So right now, when the company is making money, there's no set strategy that we've been made aware of that is used to allocate this money to specific regions. But with this, we can pinpoint the exact locations where the terminals are being used. And with this information, we can realize that a higher proportion may be allocated towards provinces where higher usage is used as well. So this way, the actual users of the machine can indicate their preferences through the fields that we mentioned earlier. And combined with the data on how much they're using, we'll be able to make the most of the money when it comes to donating it to the government. Now finally, we'll be able to maintain stronger relationships with our customers as well. By having a loyalty pro program, they'll feel more intrigued to keep coming back to our machines when it comes to spending their money on these gaming activities. So with this in mind, it's really important to make sure that we maintain these relationships. And we feel that by having this loyalty program, we'll be able to do just that. Now I'll be passing along to my colleague to talk about the timeline of the events with respect to this project here. So before Australia goes deep diving into the overall timeline of the event, we'll go look into the, uh, the four different sections, which is split off into initiation, planning, executing, and closing. So with initiation, it's the aspect of seeing an opportunity or solving a problem that you see fit. So in this case, it's actually gathering information about the players, but also increasing the engagement rate with those terminals. And the planning phase is solely uh, researching on the resource allocation. And this requires things such as the people, the time, the knowledge, uh, the materials, and the equipment that might be needed. And the executing should be only focused on executing. And you shouldn't be doing any planning whatsoever. And uh, of course, with the executing, uh, you will have a little bit of hiccups like with any project. But we will hopefully, through the planning phase, look through all the knowns of knowns and all the unknowns as well. And with the closing, we'll then, uh, as the third party uh, or uh, company is building this application, that they'll sort of uh, go over to Atlantic Lottery to um, teach the Atlantic Lottery employees on how to maintain that system so that it can be run on a day-to-day -day operation basis. So actually, we'll get into the first uh, phase one of initiation that has already been completed. You have assessed and found out that you do need to increase the engagement and um, gather more information about the players themselves. Now, Eric mentioned our strategy that we are very excited to implement, which will go on to our planning phase. Now, the planning phase would really look into gathering information on our players itself, as well as gaining knowledge about the company and uh, the product that we are creating itself. Throughout this phase, the third party that is working on the application will be working on it uh, throughout this planning phase that we are working on on our end. But the team members that will be working on this um, and completing it by September 2017, if we move on to the next slide, would be the operation subject matter experts in terms, and they will work with the third uh, party in terms of getting a uh, fuller knowledge of how their application is going to work and how it's going to work for us itself. We'll also have the business analysts look, uh, collect the data and see and assess it and see what data we can use to implement into the, in, into the program itself um, while helping the third party formulate our program. And then the project manager itself will monitor the third party build and make sure it's coming up to our timeline of September 2017. Once we are done with the planning phase, we're straight into the execution phase. At this part, we will be integrating their system into, into our files, making sure that it is seamless. Um, and then we'll just do a soft launch in the Prince Edward Islands, uh, because it is smaller than the other provinces. Uh, we'll just test it there, do some tests there, and make sure that um, the business analysts, if we go into the next phases, we'll see that our team, the business analysts, will track the data from the soft launch itself um, and see what data we need um, uh, that will apply to improving the program in terms of customer satisfaction. And then the operation subject matter experts will actually look into the technical side of it. So seeing if there's any mistakes or, or creases that need to be fixed um, and work with the third party to um, improve the application itself. Um, and then the project manager, uh, we will oversee that it will be completed within the timeline of April that's coming up. But, um, and then uh, once we have uh, completed the soft launch, 
we'll get into the actual uh, launch of the loyalty program itself. And that will uh, focus, because we have dealt with this technical side of it a lot, we will deal with actually seeing if um, uh, the distribution of the cards itself. Because you have a lit, uh, list of um, players that have consent to contacting them, sending it out by mail, mass mail, also having the cards available at stores, as well as having them with the uh, video, um, the VSLs itself um, as distribution. And then we'll um, have banner displays and have uh, brand ambassadors. That's where the brand team will come into play. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we're just, this will be our team itself. The business analysts will assess and track the data um, and pinpoint what the players actually want their money to be going to, the strategy that Eric touched on beforehand. And uh, the brand team will work with the data assessed um, and, um, and for the community outreach and make sure that the profits are going to the correct people themselves. So um, in terms of the closing of it, we do want to do a performance appraisal, so uh, assessment of the actual performance itself, reaching out to the community and seeing how they are liking this new uh, rewards program and if it's working for them. On the technical aspect, uh, the, our teams of uh, specialty uh, managers as well as the third party will work on just um, increasing and benefiting the program itself. So with the finances here, this just gives a brief overview of what the budget is. Essentially, we're going to be using all the money, except for in the official launch and marketing phase, we'll be splitting up that $100,000 or so that we have between these two parts here to make sure that we can market it and make sure people are aware of it. Now with this in mind, to address certain risks in the project, we want to be sure that we have open lines of communication to ensure that uh, the project finishes within time. And we want to establish a loyalty program as well, make sure that the brand is present. Thank you. Could you go back two slides? Yeah, sure. Okay, that one. So risk mitigation. Uh, I just read something you went right through, so I wanted to read it again. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so your mitigation plan said loyalty program is not accepted as high disregard. I totally agree that's a risk. Mm -hmm. uh, your mitigation is what? So uh, in terms of the mitigation, <coughs> I briefly touched on it, but uh, when we have displays uh, in stores, we'll have brand ambassadors go to high frequency places to see why it's so successful there, okay. um, and lower frequency, and to just uh, speak to the customers there, um, to uh, and just emphasize on the engagement with the community, and as well as the surveys themselves, to really understand what's going on and mitigate accordingly. Okay, so would that be so that would be some of our staff. Our, our that would be our staff. Yeah, the okay. brand team itself. Um, would that would be their their um, job to make sure that they perceived uh, the perceived uh, perception of our brand is uh, being properly okay. represented. So would that be additional costs? So after the project is all finished, if I, if I have to is that with the existing staff, or do I have new roles that I have to put in where I have to increase staff? Uh, so with that in mind, it was assumed that it would be the existing staff that is going out to do it. Okay. However, with the information that we're given, if it's believed that uh, the frequency is too, or the business is too high at these locations, or higher than expected, then what we do is hire additional staff to go and assume that role there and help the team further uh, ensure that we're making any corrections as needed to be sure that we're making the best use of our resources and terminals at these stores. What's the risk associated with choosing PI? I mean, you choose PI smaller products, that's your assumption, but why are they demographically similar to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick? Or what's, is there a risk involved here? Uh, so there is a, a risk for sure because, um, again, as you mentioned, not all provinces are the same in terms of their demographics. Uh, the reason why we chose PI was due to the fact that it was a small location where if something happened to go wrong in the implementation phase, uh, the problems wouldn't go too, too far out of hand. Now, what the risk that we could see here is maybe, although the sample size is small and that's a good thing on one end, it could also be a bad thing on another end where we're not necessarily gaining uh, full representation of the full Canadian population. Uh, but we feel that by really targeting and, um, I guess, implementing this program in phases rather than all at once, we're reducing the risk of the program failing. Um, and being sure that we can just uh, launch it as strong as possible. Uh, what happens if we run out of money? Uh, with the uh, budget for it? If, if you run out of money, what's your process to uh, 
either uh, handle money or be, be requesting more, knowing that these are public funds? We would really uh, focus on our um, engagement with um, external uh, funds in terms of the government themselves, because we are going to be giving profits to um, the uh, profits to different community outreaches. Uh, we would look to those specific um, uh, regulations and, and see if they will work with us in terms of to increase uh, um, the budget itself, so that we are gaining more profits that go towards the community in that aspect. How would you keep the uh and keep players informed through the process. I mean, the four provinces are part of ALC. How do you plan to keep it? I haven't seen anything about communications. How do you plan to keep us informed or keep them informed? Right, so with that aspect, uh, one of the risks, uh, like, I, or like we mentioned, the, the time of the project takes longer than expected, and that's actually could be the result of there may be like lots of miscommunication within those different municipalities of the different governments, so PI, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and, uh, and New Brunswick. And in order to sort of um, keep constant communication, it would be sending you know weekly updates in terms of what's happening with uh, internal members, but also external members as well. And we feel that communication is a very key aspect, whether in whether project management, accounting, tax, or uh, finance, um, that you always keep your team members up to date. So this can be in the form of um, you know Skype for business, or you know uh, internal memos, or email, so that uh, all the teams are informed on a weekly basis. One point in time, and I'm not sure which slide it was, you're talking about your known unknowns and how you want, uh, you want to plan your contingency. How would you plan for your unknown unknowns? Right, so planning for those, uh, like I mentioned, those unknown unknowns. Um, yeah. Because they're unknowns, you can't necessarily plan for them, mm -hmm. but during that execution phase, um, one of the methods that we would like to use is sort of, rather than a waterfall, it would be an agile method where you're sort of breaking down in smaller pieces. And this, and because of the type of project that it is, uh, we feel that the agile method is the best way because you're sort of breaking down into small chunks so that you can, in each uh, executing phase, like Shania mentioned, in those different steps, you sort of see, uh, you know, in the first phase, uh, the business analyst looking at all this information. Oh, I see a hiccup here. Mm -hmm. so then you'll sort of go through that cycle again, fix it, then go on to the next stage. Yeah. That's it. Thank you.